When I was in Bible college and taking Greek class, we had it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, so we had time, and um, the teacher at the end of every class would assign us the next lesson in our, in our Greek book, and uh, it usually involved some new words, some new verb endings and things like that, and then it included just a little portion of two or three Greek sentences that we had to translate and translate properly. And uh, the teacher's name was Randy Wilson. He was a younger guy, so he was pretty good to get along with, and we named, we named our game Randy Roulette. And we would all show up for class. Maybe one or two guys did their homework. But we'd show up for class, and we'd all be opening our books up for the first time in days. And we're trying desperately to translate that first verse. And he would pick on somebody in the class. And he would say, okay, J.R., give us uh, your interpretation of the first sentence there. If it wasn't us, we'd hurriedly go to the next sentence. Start trying to translate it. And if he picked somebody else, if you were lucky, you didn't get picked at all. If you were kind of lucky, you got, to pick, you got picked on the third one because you had more time to translate it. And it was just Randy Roulette. If he picked on you and you weren't ready, well, that was a deduction in your grade, all right? So you guys have been playing hog roulette, hoping I don't pick on you. Who studied the seven thunders? I wonder, hmm, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to ask you if you have any idea. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, I think a clue to this is what John said in the middle of verse 4. I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, you can say, well, that's kind of splitting hairs. Well, the whole Bible has hairs to split in it. And uh, I have learned that the very language of practically every verse in the Bible is deliberate, well, all of the verses are deliberate. The way that they're said, uh, things that God, um, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When, um, when Paul mentioned that in, um, in uh, let's see, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul mentioned that he had a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, you notice that he did not identify what that thorn was. He didn't say such and such or this and that is my thorn. All he said was that there was a devil, a messenger, an angel of Satan that came to him and buffeted him, beat him up, okay, tore him up, kept him, kept him humble, kept him pure. But he never did say what it was. We speculate that it may have had something to do with his eyesight because he couldn't see there toward the end, and he was having people write out what he dictated to them. And then in the book of Galatians, he takes the pen, and he says, see what, with what large letter I write unto you with my own hand. That was Paul's way of letting them know it really did come from Paul. Uh, and the fact that he couldn't see, because he mentions in another place, he said, if, if you could have, you would have given your own eyes to me. So we know that it was a deal with his eyes. But Paul didn't mention that the thorn that he had was related to his eyes. So what does that mean? It means that if you want to find out if 
you have a thorn in your flesh, which you probably do, and you want to find out what it is, go to the Scripture. The Scriptures actually broaden the meaning of what thorns represent in the Bible. In the parable of the seed and the sower, where the seed is sown, but the thorns and the thistles choke it out, Jesus says that it's the, um, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. Um, I can't remember the, the third thing, but there was three things there that Jesus uh, sort of gave us a clue on about what the, what the thorns represent. And you can go back into, um, let's see here, in uh, Judges chapters 1 and 2 uh, and part of 3, you can see that the, the, re the remnants of the Canaanites and the Hittites that Joshua and his men left in the land when they were told clearly to wipe them all out. There's our egg people right there, everybody. The egg heads are here finally. And there they go, leaving the church. No, just uh, it, uh, the, the Canaanites and the Hittites that were left in the land, God said, they're, I'm gonna, they're going to be thorns in your sides because you left them there and you're always going to be vexed by them. They're going to cause trouble in your land. And um, I will say that any amount of compromise in our life where God clearly tells us to do something and we absolutely refuse to do it. And I don't mean slip up every now and then. I mean refuse to do it. When we compromise, God has a way of turning those things that we compromise on into vexations and thorns. Thus with the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites. All of those tribes, all those people that they left in the land ended up being uh, not good for the Israelites because they taught them their religion. And pretty soon, once Israel's in the land and they're living free, all of a sudden now they're turning over to Baal and Ashtaroth. Well, where'd they learn about Baal and Ashtaroth from? From the Canaanites. That was their God. And so um, that's, that's what I mean by the Bible leaving things open for you so that when you study the scriptures, you can get an expanded meaning on what different things mean in the Bible, but as long as you stick with the Bible, all right? Now, I shared with you, let's see here, last week, a little bit about what I think. I have a, I have a real issue believing that seven thunders uttered their voices, but it's not written anywhere in Scripture, because I believe that after Revelation, it's done. All of the scripture giving that God has done is done at the end of the book of Revelation. Um, it was you that asked that question, wasn't it? Uh, about um, knowing somebody that followed the Old Testament and they, they said that the Bible, the Old Testament doesn't account for a New Testament because in the Old Testament, God said you're not, you're not supposed to add to nor diminish aught from the words that he gave them. And so, was this person Jewish? Okay, so he was a Jew and he believed that there couldn't be a New Testament from God because God swore in the book of Deuteronomy that none of the words, that you couldn't add to the words of the law and you couldn't take away from the words of the law. And what I uh, sent back to Brian to tell him was, that number one, um, the whole of God's word is his word. And God, God can surely add to his own word if he wants to. Number two, God promised in Jeremiah 31 in the law that God would give them a new covenant that was not like the covenant that their fathers made at Mount Sinai. It was going to be a completely different testament and that God would simply just forgive their sins, he'd wipe away all their iniquities, and that God would be their God and they would be his people. So clearly, God intended in the writing of the Old Testament to include a new covenant for the people of Israel. So anyway, um, let's see here. Where, oh, anyway, but my, my thing is, I think the seven thunders should be in the Bible. 
But it's something that John never wrote. Who can tell me what books John wrote? What books of the Bible did John write? Say that again without your hand in your mouth this turn. There you go. Five books. And in five books, I don't think John wrote down what the seven thunders were. But let's look at what the Bible says. Exodus 20, 18, all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. The presence of God there. 1 Samuel 2, 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven, here it is now, out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Think of that in what's written in 1 Samuel as a reference to, um, you could say, number one, you could say that it's a reference to when God said, this is my beloved son, because some said that it thundered. And I'm going to read that verse in a little bit. Um, or maybe Golgotha, when Christ was uh, on the cross. But also, in the last days, which clearly, this is a reference to what happens in the last days, uh, when the seven seals have been fulfilled, and now we've gone through six of the seven trumpets, and so we have seven thunders uttering their voice. So clearly, I think, in the last days, uh, this verse is a reference to that. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them, uh, because there are adversaries to the Lord. If you are against God, you're going to get it in the last days. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, which would be Christ, and exalt the horn of his anointed. The Hebrew word there would be Mashiach, Messiah, and the Greek form of that would be Christos, Christ. So he shall exalt the horn of his anointed. He shall exalt the horn of Christ in the last days. And clearly we can believe that. 1 Samuel 7, 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. Big mistake. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines. Come on. And discomfited them. It means they scattered them, messed them all up, and they were smitten before Israel. Did you hear that lightning hit not too far from our house yesterday afternoon? You heard it? Yeah, I was sitting back in the office like, <laughs> I didn't like it. Somewhere over there in the woods, there's a tree laying dead, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, we had, we had lightning hit a great big cedar right on the edge of our driveway, right at the property line, early in the morning one morning. And I mean, it was as loud, loudest thing I've ever heard. And when we got up to go look to see what it hit, there were pieces of cedar that had blown way over like 75, 100 yards. And you had this strong smell of cedar in the air and it was like man i smell cedar all the way over here it what happens is that lightning gets in there and it's it's only like you know ten thousand degrees hotter than the sun is so all the moisture in a tree instantly turns to steam what happens when steam replaces water it expands and it literally blew that tree completely apart. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I'm just glad I wasn't out there watching it when it happened. Because I'd be under the house. No, I wouldn't be under the house, I can tell you that. Anyway, Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. Here, here again is another example of God doing the fighting that he knows Israel can't win. Think about that. Sin is a battle that you cannot win. You're never going to win. I don't care what Joel Osteen says. I don't care what Joyce Meyer says. I don't care what anybody else says. 
When you try to fight sin without Christ, you are going to lose every time. Why is that? God made us weak so that he could be strong in us so that when it comes time to do some praising and glorifying, we're not glorifying one another, we're not praising one another, we're praising God for what he did. He did it here, he's done it in other places, Second Chronicles chapter 20 uh, is where God said, um, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And God had, these three armies were coming down, and God had them all fighting one another so that they all killed one another. That would be a great movie to make. And, um, and here you have the same thing. God is the one, when he released his great thunder upon the Philistines, it messed them up so bad, and God just smote them where they were. And Israel just went out and gathered in the spoil. 2 Samuel 22 the Lord, now notice this, underline this, because this is important. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice. I love how the Bible defines itself, or gives you clarity in a verse. When it says the Lord thundered from heaven, if you leave off the rest of that verse, it, it probably wouldn't make as much sense. You wouldn't know what what God meant or what the Bible meant about what it means when God thunders from heaven. You might end up thinking that, well, that's just God making noise. And it sounds like thunder. But what the rest of this verse defines for you is what it means when it says the Lord thundered from heaven. It says that the Most High, who is the Lord, uttered His voice. God's voice, we know now, sounds like thunder. And I want to hear that one of these days, but not in this body. Amen? Turn to John 12. Turn your Bibles there. Underline these things. Jesus says in verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I think we have a clue here. God, has, God said, I've already glorified it, past tense. So there's something that God has already done concerning Christ to glorify him. And he promises that he's going to glorify the Son again, last days. So, John gives us, I think, a clue. But again, God told John not to write it. So John didn't write it. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. It thundered when they heard God's voice. It sounds like thunder. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Um... Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Turn to, uh, let's see here, where am I wanting to go? Second Peter. Turn to Second Peter. There you go. And look at verse 16. Chapter 1. Thank you. It's already sweating season for me. Verse 16, chapter 1, 2 Peter. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables 
when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Um, some people might misunderstand this, so I'm going to say this. When Jesus taught parables, parables are not fables. Keep that in mind. Now, Aesop, this Greek poet, he told fables, Aesop's fables. But Jesus taught parables. Uh, and a parable is sort of defined as an, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or a spiritual meaning. When Jesus said there was a certain rich man, he didn't say, let's say or let's pretend that there was a certain rich man. He didn't say that. He said there was a certain rich man. Jesus knew this man. And he said there was also a beggar named Lazarus. Jesus knew Lazarus. When Jesus then describes hell and the place that the rich man is in, he's not making up fables. He's telling the truth. When he talks about Lazarus being taken to Abraham's bosom, he's not making that up either. He's telling the truth. And so I don't believe that any of the fables that Jesus... Or, or I said it. I, I better pay for that. <laughs> That's all the change I got to God, so he's got to help me out from here on out. I don't believe any of the things that Jesus said were fables. They were, they were stories. They were true stories. Um, the parable of the seed and the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the widow's mite, all of those, I believe, are true stories. And I got into this conversation with some Jehovah's Witness on my front doorstep one time. When, they tried, when I started quoting the scriptures about hell... <laughs> They said, oh, that was just uh, fables that Jesus made up. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There was a certain rich man. That's his, his, his exact words. So anyway, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this is Peter telling his audience, those who are reading this letter and hearing this letter, that... What Peter is telling them, he didn't just hear third hand or second hand. He was there. He saw every bit of it. And verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter said, I heard that voice with my own ears. And so Peter then says in verse 19, paraphrasing it, would say, rather than listening and trusting in me, we actually have something better than my testimony. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So Peter, using things like this here in John 12, where some said that it thundered, uh, others heard God's voice, but it sounded like thunder. And God testifying that he's, he has already glorified Jesus in a, in a very particular way. And he's going to glorify him again. Um, and Jesus says, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, let's go to uh, Job. Turn backwards. I don't know why I... Went backwards with this, but I did. Job chapter 37. Again, another 
testimony, a second witness, that the thundering from heaven is God's voice. Job 37, 3. He directeth it unto the whole heaven, and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. Ain't that the truth? For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, and to the great rain of his strength. And say amen to that, because my wife is, she is like, I want to plant a garden this year. And I said, honey, I'm doing what I can. Well, the ground's too wet. I said, I know, you're going to have to complain to the guy that sent the rain. Don't tell me, I ain't got nothing to do with it. I don't think she does that. But clearly here again, God thundereth marvelously with his voice. So I, I am led to believe that the seven thunders are God's voice. Now does anybody have just a guess, just a guess at what you think the seven thunders might have uttered. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Gary? You went to seminary? Gary, Gary, in seminary. What did they teach you there? Which says... Okay. Why do you think that? Okay. 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 Uh, you could be right. Could be right. Roger. What do you think? We're playing Hoggard roulette now. You never know who I'm going to pick next. Yeah. Cubby, what do you think? Think he was speaking of his judgment? That was about to calm down on him, right? Okay. Anybody else want to give it a whirl? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he could swear by no greater. Yeah, that's where I'm going eventually. You know, when we get there, that's I'm going to go back to Abraham. I will. I will say this to you. I've already read to you what I think it is. I've already read it to you. Psalm twenty-nine, verse three: The voice of the Lord is upon the waters; the God of glory thundereth. There's another. Uh, testimony, another witness, that this is the voice of God. The Lord is upon many waters. Psalm 77, the voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world and the earth trembled and shook. The voice of thy thunder. Psalm 81, 7, thou callest in trouble and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah. Selah means think about it. Pause and reflect and muse on this. Psalm 104, verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? By the way, I'm going to throw this in here. That does not tell you that the earth is flat. The earth has foundations. That doesn't mean it's flat. It means that the entire earth is founded by God, it is in a set position, and every square inch of dirt on the surface is being pulled irrevocably downward.
by gravity and if it wasn't for a solid foundation underneath where I'm standing right now, we would all fall like quicksand down into the heart of the earth. Okay? Can a, can a, a, a basketball, can a basketball have a foundation? Yes, it's called air pressure. When you suck all the air out of a basketball, what happens to it? Turns flat, doesn't it? When you fill it up with air, what happens then? The surface of the basketball is relying upon the air pressure, which is always wanting to push its way out. That's why when you pop a balloon, what happens to the air inside? It goes out. Thanks for the sound effects. Although it doesn't go, it goes, okay? But it's always pushing out. So the surface of a balloon or the surface of a basketball or a volleyball or a beach ball or your head has a foundation. It's held in by something that is pushing its way out to counter gravity, all right? Anyway, thought I'd throw that in there. The, the, the flat earth people are making a, a second coming. Um... A pastor called me a couple weeks ago, want my input on it, and he said a guy in his church came over to his house and said, did you know the earth's flat? And this pastor, he's no dummy, he told him, he said, I'm going to cut you off right here. Don't waste your time and don't waste mine. And he said, you know, one thing about you flat earth people, he said, that, that I've noticed, he said, that's the only thing you ever talk about. He said, you don't talk about God, you don't talk about salvation, you don't talk about the gospel, you don't witness to anybody, you don't warn people that hell's real. All you, got, all you do is talk about how flat the earth is and how everybody else is wrong. So, anyway, um, you guys are probably smarter than that. I hope you are. Um, who laid the foundation of the earth, Psalm 104, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. That's talking about the flood. At thy rebuke, they fled. At the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. So this voice of thunder does have a lot to do with God's judgment uh, coming down on those people and so on. Um, Cubby, in, in light of that, can you think of something specific that God has said in the scriptures that you think leans in that direction? And would you find it seven times in the scripture? I've already read it to you. Anybody want to take a quick guess now before we move on? All right, Revelation 10. Nobody's asking. Revelation 10. Yeah. I like this. If you ask me, I'll tell you later. All you got to do is ask. I'll tell you. But you've already, you've already read it, and you already read it today. Okay? That's a clue. You already read it. Revelation chapter 10, verse 5. Oh! Oh, well, we'll have to wait for nothing. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'll have all my rabbits tied up. I know what I'm doing. All right. Uh, Revelation, the um, swore by him that liveth forever is, is not a big mystery. Um, we'll talk about this next Sunday, but that's, that's what Abraham did. And, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. And uh, he swore by himself because he could swear by no greater well we'll cover that next sunday all right let's go to prayer lord bless you this morning heavenly father we love you 
And we thank you, God, for this amazing book, Lord, everything that we need, everything we need to know, everything, God, that pertains to life and salvation and uh, our homes, our families, our country. Lord, all of it, Lord, is right here in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this amazing, amazing book. And Father, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong in something I say or something that I believe or something that I'm guessing at, Lord, this book is never, ever wrong. It can't be wrong because it is literally your presence here in this place today. And we thank you, Lord, for joining with us today. We ask God, Lord, that you meet with each and every one of us uh, personally, privately, and Lord, and just deal with us this morning and uh, show us wonderful and marvelous things from your word, Lord, that will help us go throughout our lives this week. Bless your word in Jesus' name and amen.